Good morning, Calvary. Today's passage can be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 8b through 10, which is also on page 966 in your pew Bibles. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold, we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing today? I was thinking, I talked to a number of people between services, and, and uh, there was a, probably about three people I talked to. I said, hey, how are you doing today? And they said, no, oh, you know, I'm doing okay. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I feel like that some days, right? You know, but we're going to make it. We're going to make it. It's okay. The Lord's with us. So, you know, if that's how you feel this morning, like, how are you doing? You're like, yeah, I'm okay. It's good. It's fine. Jesus is with us. We'll be all right. So we're here this morning. The sun is shining. God still loves us. It's all good. Um, this morning, wait, before I get going, I want to make a little uh, blurb off of uh, what Pastor Greg mentioned in announcements earlier this, uh, when we got the service started. Maybe you were not here for that. But I want to just draw attention to the fact that we're doing a missions trip this summer uh, as a church to Mexico. And uh, I think we got a slide up here with the information on it. So if you're interested in that, you can see the dates, you can uh, check out online more information. But our youth group went there last year and uh, with some of our missionaries uh, in Mexico. And this year, we're kind of opening it up to the whole church. And so if you, uh, so this can be an adult trip. So if you're interested in a missions trip in uh, Mexico, that's something you'd like to do. Uh, uh, you know, pray about that, talk to, to one of the pastors here, find some more information online, we'd love to have you join us. So I'll make sure you're aware uh, that that is happening. But this morning, we start our sermon series, or restart our sermon series in 2 Corinthians, uh, picking up from where we left off last spring. So maybe uh, you're newer-ish to Calvary in the last three or four months, and you didn't know that we have been doing a sermon series in 2 Corinthians. We've actually been doing it for a number of years. So we began our sermon series in 2 Corinthians in the spring of 2022, and then we carried it through the summer and into the fall, and then we took a break for Missions Month and Advent and Epiphany and Lent and then Holy Week, and we picked it back up in the spring of 23 and ran it through the summer and the fall, and then it took a break again. Uh, last year for Missions Month and Advent and Epiphany and Lent and Holy Week. And here we are again picking back up our sermon series in the spring of 24, and we'll run it through the summer and into the fall. And I'm determined this time that we're going to finish it up uh, here in the fall by Missions Month. Don't know exactly how long it's going to take us, but we'll uh, see uh, how it goes. But we're picking back up in uh, where we left off last year, which was at the end of chapter 10, but rather than simply just starting right back up, I thought I would use uh, this morning's sermon as a sort of recap of where we've been in the letter. So what I'm going to do this morning is highlight a key passage or a theme from each of the 10 chapters up to this point in the letter. And this will help us then kind of broaden out uh, or understand some of the broader aims of the book and set us up for next week when we begin uh, improper. And uh, if you... Uh, haven't been here for the previous sermons uh, in the Second Corinthians sermon series. This will help kind of get you up to speed. And if you have been, but it's been a while, and I had to review some of my own uh, notes on this as well. So hopefully this will get us up to speed. So rather than a single sermon point, which is kind of how I try to do a lot of my sermons, just more focused, uh, this is going to be sort of a, a, a potpourri of points. We're going to have uh, actually going to have 10 points, one for each chapter. And my prayer is that the Lord uh, will use uh, our kind of survey through 2 Corinthians to highlight maybe one or two things in your life that you in particular 
need. So maybe not every highlight is going to be for you this morning, but maybe the Lord has just one or two things He wants to say to you this morning specifically. So I've been praying towards that end, and I want to pray towards that end as we get started this morning, and then we'll jump into our text. So pray with me. Father, thank You for giving us uh, Your grace each day. Thank You uh, for giving us Your grace when the sun is shining. Thank You for giving us Your grace when it's not. Thank You that You are faithful uh, through all of it. Thank You that You give Your rain and Your sun uh, freely to both the righteous and the unrighteous. And uh, Lord, I thank You uh, even more than that, that You have given us hearts to see and to receive and to understand that all the good things that we have come from you. So we pray for more of your grace poured out into our lives even this morning, and I pray that you would uh, reveal the things that you want to uh, reveal to our hearts through your Spirit this morning, just the one or two things maybe that you want to remind or encourage us on this morning. And so we invite your Spirit's uh, work in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to begin where we began, uh, which is in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And in our very first sermon, we looked at the golden chain, as I called it. And so in verses 3 through 4 of chapter uh, 1, we see this golden chain. Let me read this for us. By the way, get your Bibles out because we're going to be moving through, uh, and I'm going to keep reading various passages. So have your Bible available as we read um, and, and keep it open. All right, so 1 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, we began our series looking at this golden chain. Sometimes I called it the golden chain of grace. Sometimes I called it the golden chain of peace or the golden chain of love or the golden chain of discipleship. Here in this passage, it's the golden chain of comfort. And the idea behind the golden chain is that God comforts us. God the Father comforts us here in our afflictions, this golden chain of comfort, so that we can receive the comfort of God and then pass this comfort on to others in their affliction. And the point that I made about this golden chain is that everything that we have, all the good things that we have in life, come to us from God. We are not the generative source of the comfort or the love or the grace or the discipleship. We are conduits of grace. We are not fountains of grace. But we are not simply pass-through conduits. We don't receive grace like a commodity like something we receive externally, like you gave me money and I held it in my hand and I passed it on to someone else who had a need, or like a loaf of bread that we pass on to someone else. We have to actually receive the grace that is given to us into ourselves. We have to actually eat the grace, as it were, consume the loaf of bread, take the grace into us, make it our own in order for us to pass it on to others. So a main emphasis of the golden chain of grace is that if we're not careful, we can too quickly focus on passing the grace along before we've properly focused on receiving the grace. So how can I pass along the love of God if I've not deeply and meaningfully received the love of God? Or how can I pass along the comfort of God if I have not deeply and meaningfully received the comfort and peace of God. So we need to breathe in the grace of God before we can breathe out the grace of God. So maybe that's a good reminder for some of you here this morning. Maybe you're oxygen starved because you're forgetting to breathe in. And just working harder or tightening the screws or trying to white-knuckle it isn't going to be the answer for you. Maybe you need, in this season of life, to let go of your focus on doing for the Lord and, for a moment, focus on receiving from the Lord. You need to turn, perhaps, your attention away from what's down-chain of you and the responsibilities that you have down-chain And you need to turn your attention and your heart back 
to the grace of God that is flowing to you from up chain. So maybe that's a reminder for you, the golden chain of discipleship, the golden chain of grace, the golden chain of love, the golden chain of comfort. All right, the second uh, highlight comes from chapter 2, the triumphal procession. Found this in 2, 14 through 16. You can look in your text there. Paul writes, verse 14, but thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to one the fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? One of the things that we've seen throughout our sermon series in 2 Corinthians is that Paul is always having to defend his apostolic authority. These so-called super apostles, as Paul derisively uh, refers to them. They were some Jewish false teachers. They've come in behind Paul. So Paul planted the church in Corinth, and then he left. And after he left, these super apostles came in behind him. And they were saying that Paul wasn't all that. And they're showing off to the Corinthians their letters of recommendation from the, the church back in Jerusalem, which is kind of the headquarters, as it were, of the church. And they're brandishing their good connections. They're showing off their Rolex watches and their ministry successes. And they point out that Paul, for his part, just keeps getting run out of town. Everywhere he goes, he's always stirring up controversy. He gets run out of town or he gets arrested, he gets put in jail, or he gets stoned or he gets publicly beaten. And they're right. What the super apostles are saying is right. Paul's ministry is not characterized by earthly successes and glory. It's characterized by weakness and trials. And so for the super apostles, that's evidence that Paul is not a real apostle. But here in these verses, Paul is reminding the Corinthians that true Christians follow in the footsteps of Christ, who himself suffered and died. And to make this point, Paul says that Christ leads the, Christ, the Christians in triumphal procession. Now, that might sound like a glorious, great thing from our mindset of what we imagine triumphal processions would be, but when Paul says that Christ leads His people in triumphal procession, he doesn't mean that Christ leads His people in our version of a modern-day victory parade. In the Greco-Roman world, it was the vanquished who were the ones that were led in triumphal procession. To be led in a triumphal procession was to be paraded as a spoil of war, as a defeated foe by a victorious general. And so Paul is saying that for those who follow Christ, their lives are going to look like they are being led in defeat. But when Christians march through the defeats of this world, trusting in the care and love and joy of Christ, their lives bear witness then to a hope that lies beyond the successes and the defeats of this world. So for those whom God is saving, who He is drawing to Himself, the faithful Christian being led in procession is the aroma of life in the midst of the world's defeats. But for those who cannot see the glory of the gospel, the faithful Christian being led in procession is only the aroma of death. Those who can't comprehend the gospel can't see beyond the earthly defeats to the reality of the hope of heavenly victory. So all throughout 2 Corinthians, Paul is calling the Corinthians to follow him as he follows Christ to the cross. And he is exhorting them to not be led astray by the teachings of the super apostles, to not be led up the garden path by these false teachers who would only promise earthly victory and success, which then leads to our highlight from chapter 3, the glory of Christ. If true glory is not found in successes of the world, where is it found? It's found in Christ. So in chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, Paul writes this, Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters of stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? 
For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. So these super apostles that had come in behind Paul, they were experts in the law, in the Jewish law, in the law of Moses. And so they were telling the Corinthians that the true glory lay in Judaism and in the Jewish law. And so they pointed to Moses then, who had a shining face of glory, as the prime example of God's glory. And so they were saying to the Corinthians, if you want Moses' glory, which is God's glory, then you just listen to us because we know Moses and we can take you to God's glory. But Paul's point here, and then all throughout 2 Corinthians, is that the glory of Christ far exceeds the glory of Moses. Because Moses' glory, for as good as it was, was only temporary earthly glory. Yes, it was from God, because all glory is from God. Even earthly glory is from God. But earthly glory is temporary, and it's fading, whereas Christ's glory is eternal and divine. And so Paul doesn't want the Corinthians to get swept up into thinking that earthly glory and earthly success is where it's at, because it's not. And if you let me cheat down into chapter 4, verse 6, he gets very explicit about where this true glory is found. He writes in 4, 6, For the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is where true glory is found. It's found in the face of Jesus Christ. The true hope of this life And of the life to come is found in our share of God's glory in Christ. And that leads naturally into the highlight from chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. The treasure of God, the glory of God, is in jars of clay. So Paul writes this in in 4, 7 through 10. He says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may, may be manifested in our mortal flesh. And Paul here is using the analogy of a treasure in a clay pot. It's a way of helping the Corinthians understand the treasure of the gospel. Paul saying that the glory of the gospel is not what we see on the outside, how decorative our pot is, or how fancy or elaborate our lives are. The glory of the gospel is what lies hidden within the pot, beneath the surface. And in fact, Paul says, the commonness or even the brokenness of the pot helps us understand all the more that our true glory doesn't lie in the pot, but with what's in the pot. Now, these super apostles, they were all about the pot, but Paul is all about what lay within the pot. So Paul's glory doesn't come from fancy robes and long resumes of earthly success, doesn't come from happy marriages and good kids and a two-car garage and early retirement. His glory came from Christ, and so does ours. And because the Christian's true glory lies within, the Christian, Paul says, can be afflicted but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Outwardly, our lives may reflect the death and the suffering of Jesus. But as we find our hope in Christ in the midst of our broken pottery, we manifest the life and the hope of Jesus. So maybe these last three points are a needed reminder 
for some here this morning. Because maybe your pot just isn't doing so well. You're in a season of life where it's fractured or the shine has been rubbed off. And you're tempted to despair. And if that's you, you have all of my sympathies. I think you have all of Paul's sympathies as well. Paul recognizes that broken pots are painful. A broken pot, he says here, brings affliction, perplexion, persecution. It involves being struck down. And these are all hard things. But, Paul is saying, they're not everything. There is a hope that lies beyond the hopes of this life. So I make no naive, simple proclamations that finding hope in the midst of the ruins of your earthly life is easy because it's not easy. In fact, I think it's the hardest work of the Christian life to find hope and joy in Jesus when our, when our earthly life begins to fracture and fall. Really, it only comes about to steal an expression from last uh, couple months of sermons, it only comes about as a subversive miracle of God. But it is possible. So as Paul says, goes on to say in verse 16, we shouldn't lose heart. Though our elder, outer self is wasting away, our inner self, he says, is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction that we face in this life is right now even though it doesn't seem like it, it is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comparison. So Paul tells us we should keep looking at the things that are unseen, at the life that is within our broken pot. For the brokenness that we see around us externally, that's transient, it's temporary. But the unseen glory within the pot, which is Christ Himself, this is eternal. And that's a good segue then to our highlight for chapter 5, the for us of Jesus in 5, 14 through 15. Paul in 5, 14 through 15 writes, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all and therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And we see this golden chain at work again here. Christ died for us so that we might no longer live for ourselves, but we would live for him. And it's only because God has given us Christ for us that we then can give ourselves for him and for others. So when we're born into this world, we're born vulnerable and frail. And we learn quickly that we need to take care of ourselves. But all of that taking care of ourselves, however necessary it is, and it's especially necessary when we're younger, all that taking care of ourselves, if left unchecked, can get in the way of us taking care of others. And Paul Throughout 2 Corinthians, we're seeing that he is able to give and to spend his life for the sake of the Corinthians because Jesus has given and spent his life for Paul. And Paul is then just simply passing on the for us of Jesus. And listen, I think so often, too often, we can get it into our minds that the foundation of the Christian life is the service that we render to God and to others. How we serve Him, how we serve others, how we love Him, how we love others, the good works that we do that represent our love for God, the good works that we do for others. But however true it is that we should love God with our whole heart and love our neighbors as ourselves, which are the greatest commandments in the Bible, none of that is possible without the for us of Jesus. Because if Jesus is not first for us, we cannot be for God and for other people. We love God and we love others, the Scriptures tell us, because God first loved us. 
So you and I are called to love the unlovable spouse, the unlovable child, the unlovable parent, the unlovable neighbor, the unlovable person from the wrong political party, to love even our unlovable enemies. And where do we get the capacity to give ourselves in love like that to others? We get it from the for us of Jesus. So we don't need to self-protect as our highest priority because God is watching over us in Christ. And all that you and I need, all that we value, all that we hold dear, even the small, smallest things in our life that we worry about, that we think we probably shouldn't worry about, God is watching over all of those things. Not even a sparrow falls to the ground, Jesus tells us, apart from the will of the Father. And even the very hairs on our head are all numbered. There is nothing outside the scope of God's care and concern and providence. And He is for us in Christ Jesus. I mean, how good news is it that the one who holds the hairs on our head and the sparrows in the sky is for us in Christ Jesus? And because He is for us, we can rest from our restless self-protection, and we can be for others. And that leads us then to chapter 6 and our sorrowful yet always rejoicing title line for this sermon series. In six chapter 10, or six, chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says that he is sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing, yet possessing everything. To feel two contradictory emotions at the same time, two emotions that in any other natural circumstance cannot exist together. That's the beauty and the miracle of Jesus in our life. Some things in this world are genuinely worth sorrowing over. Truly, not because we're weak in faith, but in the same way that Jesus wept over Lazarus' tomb, or in the same way that he wept over Jerusalem, there remains in this age true and profound sorrows, that we are not only allowed to grieve with sort of begrudging permission from God, but that we're even called to grieve, because to fail to grieve is to fail to love. But even in the midst of our sorrow and our grief, Jesus invites us to put our capacity for hope and for joy in Him. He Himself is eternal love and infinite beauty and the fullness of joy. His presence in our lives doesn't remove all of the earthly sorrow, all of the earthly hardship and suffering, but His love and His kindness and His goodness and His beauty is so potent as we open ourselves up to Him, it infuses all of our earthly hardships and sorrows, even all of our earthly blessings with God's own joy, just like water infuses a sponge. So the trials and the sufferings and the sorrows, they're still there. They don't go away. They won't go away in this life. But along with those trials and those sufferings and their hardship, there is also joy Because Jesus himself is the joy of the Lord. I've said a number of times, I'm sure I'll keep saying it, but joy has a name, and his name is Jesus. And if we have Jesus, we have the joy of the Lord. This is what God gives us. He doesn't give us joy as some commodity that we hold in our hand. God gives us himself in the person of Jesus, so that as Jesus fills up our lives more and more, we're able to live in the midst of this world, its brokenness and its sorrows and our hardships, with the joy that is God's own joy, the joy of Jesus. So to cling to the sufficiency of Jesus when all else around us fails, that is the subversive miracle. So even at the same time that we're grieving the loss of a loved one or experiencing some other earthly tragedy, 
we can simultaneously be experiencing the presence and the love and the joy of Jesus. And that's what it means to be sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Sorrowing in the truly broken things of this world, yet always rejoicing in the grace and the love of God that is the person of Jesus. Now, as I said a moment ago, finding the joy of Jesus in the midst of life's earthly trials and hardships, it's not easy. That leads us to chapter 7 and the highlight from chapter 7 in verses 5 through 6, give a Titus, take a Titus. In 5, uh, 6, and 7 of, of chapter 7, Paul says this, For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which, we, which, with which he was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. And Paul is here recounting a very difficult moment in his life. Things had gotten very hard when he was in Macedonia. And then just at the right time, when Paul was nearing the end of his rope, his friend Titus, his ministry colleague, had shown up with a good report about the situation in Corinth. And it turned out that the Corinthians were going to side with Paul rather than the super apostles. And this brought such comfort and good news for Paul. He says that it comforted him. So the coming of Titus with his good report about the Corinthians was a source of deep comfort to Paul. But the point I made from this passage is that Titus' coming didn't come in lieu of God's comfort, but Titus came as God's comfort. And in this passage, it's a reminder that God often uses His creation, and most especially His people, to mediate His grace and His comfort. God doesn't always or even typically just zap us with joy from heaven, giving us His comfort and peace. Sometimes He does, but that's more unusual. More often, He extends His love and His kindness and His grace and His comfort and His peace to us through others, through His body, through the Tituses of our lives. So you might recall I titled the sermon, Give a Titus, Take a Titus. I thought that was clever. I still think it's kind of clever. <laughs> uh, kind of basing it off the old give a penny, take a penny jars that used to be uh, at the checkout counters. If you're old enough, you remember those. And just like sometimes we have pennies to give, and sometimes we need to take a few pennies, so too in life, sometimes we are Tituses to give to others, and sometimes we need to take a Titus for ourselves. And this is an important point with all of Paul's emphasis about finding our joy in Jesus apart from the earthly glories and victories of this world. That's all true and good, but that shouldn't lead us to the conclusion that God never provides earthly comfort. He knows our limits, He knows the extent of our needs, and He gives us what we need. And we, as the body of Christ, we are God's Tituses to each other. And we need to be obedient to give ourselves to each other as the Lord directs. And we also need to be humble enough, humble enough to receive help from each other as necessary. So maybe this morning God is asking you to be a Titus in someone's life. If He's asking you to be a Titus, then be willing to give a Titus of yourself. But maybe this morning God is asking you to be humble enough to receive a Titus. And maybe you need a Titus in your life to mediate the grace and the comfort of God to you, but you are kind of keeping God at arm's length by keeping people around you at arm's length. Be willing to receive a Titus just as much as to give a Titus. And speaking of receiving help, that takes us to our highlights for chapters 8 and 9. This is kind of a twofer, so we get uh, 8 and 9 together in this a single highlight. And here I don't have a single passage to read from. This whole section, chapters 8 and 9, is about relief giving. 
So these two chapters were sort of almost a mini-sermon series within the larger series, and the chapters are focused on a relief gift that Paul is collecting from the various churches where he's done ministry to take it back to the poor in Jerusalem. And I made four points throughout uh, these couple chapters leading to a concluding fifth point. I made the point that um, relief giving should be animated by joy, not guilt. I made the point that relief giving is encouraged, it's not commanded. I made the point that relief giving is giving to Jesus, not just giving to the poor. And I made the point that relief giving aims for equality. And the last point that I made in all of this, bringing it all together, is that relief giving depends upon us first receiving the relief giving of God in Christ. It's all part of the golden chain of discipleship again. Everything that we have, both materially and spiritually, has come to us as a gift from God through Jesus. And we can only give to others spiritually or materially because God has first given to us. So we don't need to hoard our earthly things and be overly self-protective because God is taking care of us. This is Paul's point in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. He's wanting to assure the Corinthians that if they contribute to this relief effort, God is taking care of them and God will make sure that they have what they need. That's a good reminder for us too. And that brings us then to our last highlight from chapters 10, which gets us then back to where we ended last year. Chapters 10, verses 7 through 11, are about apostolic authority. So Paul writes this in 10, 7 through 11. He says, Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters. For they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. So chapter 10 begins the final section of the letter. Really, there's a number of different kind of sections or chunks of the letter, like there was a section on relief giving. Now we have this section, this last section, and Paul's primary concern in this last section of the letter, chapters 10, 11, and 12, is to deal with these super apostles. So if we read the letter quickly to the end, we know that the super apostles are a factor, but Paul doesn't actually mention the super apostles until he gets to chapter 10. Now he's going to deal with them directly. These super apostles that have been lurking in the background and in the subtext of much of what Paul is saying, he's going to take up specifically here in chapter 10. And these super apostles have been teaching a warped view of the gospel, saying, as I've pointed out, that the true glory of God consisted in the Jewish religion and and knowledge of the Jewish law. In other words, in earthly things. Or to use a term from our previous sermon series... They were teaching that the glory of God consisted in elemental things. And the super apostles trafficked in elemental glory and made promises of how they could get you more elemental glory. And they showed off their own elemental glory. And because Paul didn't have a lot of elemental worldly glory, well, that seemed like it negated his apostolic ministry. So these super apostles were speaking disparagingly disparagingly about Paul. They were saying that Paul couldn't follow through on his commitments, that he was of no account, that his gospel was of no account. They said that Paul talked a big game in his letters, but he actually couldn't back it up when he was present in person. So throughout this last section of the letter, Paul is claiming that he does indeed have legitimate apostolic authority and that he is going to come to Corinth, and then they're going to see who the true apostle really is. So this whole last section of the letter is a bit of an apostolic cage match between the apostle Paul and these super apostles to see who really is the true apostle of Jesus. 
So that's where we're picking things up next week with an apostolic cage match. And if that's not exciting to get you to come back, I don't, I don't know what is. All right. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take us, as I said, to finish out this uh, series on 2 Corinthians. We're just going to take it as it comes. Uh, my goal, as I said, is to be done in time for Missions Month in November, maybe even earlier. But regardless, as we move through this letter, we will continue to see more of the same themes that I've already highlighted here, especially the golden chain of grace and then our title verse, Sorrowful Yet Always Rejoicing. Paul's primary aim throughout the letter of 2 Corinthians is to help the Corinthians come to understand that the great hope of every human heart is to share in God's own eternal glory in Christ. All the best things in the world, however good they are, and there are many good things in this world, all the best things in this world, they're necessary types and signs, but only types and signs that carry us forward into the goodness and glory of God. And the glory of God is so glorious in Christ, so full of God's own eternal infinite goodness and love that participating in His glory can give us joy even in the midst of our sorrows. It's not always easy. We're not going to get there all at once very often. But step by step, as we look into the face of Jesus, Paul tells us in chapter 3, we are transformed into that same image day by day to be transformed into the very image of joy and love and comfort and peace itself. Such a glorious hope for us as Christians. So onward into the remainder of 2 Corinthians, and may the golden chain of God's grace get stronger in our lives. And may we experience the subversive miracle of God that enables us to increasingly have joy even in the midst of life's sorrows. Amen? All right, let's pray. God, thank you that you have given us 2 Corinthians to remind us that our true hope in life doesn't come from this life, but our true hope in this life comes from your life. And God, may you just day by day, as we stare into the face of Jesus, find that to be true. May you turn our gaze back to Christ when we get distracted and look away, when we focus on the external uh, uh, limits of the pot and don't see beyond into the true life and glory that lies within. God, keep directing our attention to you that we might know the hope and the joy and the love and the grace that lies in your own very person. God, keep us walking to you. Strengthen us in your faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.